this is Catherine O'Connell and welcome to Lawyer On Air. If you are looking for inspirational stories about women in law, then this is the podcast for you. Join me and my lawyer ladies as we enjoy a glass of wine after a hard day at work and talk about the world of women in law. It's my passion to share stories of amazing legal ladies who are working as in-house legal counsel, who have law firm roles, who are leading on boards and who are doing law differently. From time to time, I will also invite special guests on the show to share their insights on legal recruiting and tips for getting hired as a successful lawyer in Japan. I hope you will enjoy getting to know these amazing women who I am so proud to share a profession with. I'm glad you're here and I hope you enjoy the show. Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of the Lawyer On Air podcast. In this episode, I share with you another diverse story of a woman lawyer working in Japan. I'm Catherine, the host of the show, and I'm a lawyer based in Tokyo for more than 20 years. And I love helping unlock the wisdom of the stories that women lawyers never tell. What I've learned in my career in law so far is allyship and caring for others are powerful drivers in one's personal development and are underestimated but incredibly impactful to drive change. Those are the words of my guest today, Louisa Gawa. She's an experienced ESG professional with a legal education, holding an MA in international and Anglo-American laws, which qualifies her as a jurist under French law. She graduated in foreign languages, specializing in Japanese language and culture, and began her career at General Electric and then moved to Schneider Electric. Since arriving in Japan, her main focus has been on diversity and ethics within an ESG agenda. You can check out Louisa's full bio in the show notes. On this episode, Louisa shares how a life-changing experience taught her the importance of silence and the ability to hold back words when it's needed and to not fear silence when it's necessary. And this is a lesson that she has never regretted embracing until this day. She also shares her tips on how to support the CEO and business team in DEI and ESG initiatives. And she's got three great tips, both hard and soft, for lawyers to excel in these areas of their work. You'll also get Louisa's insights into the future of law from an ESG and diversity perspective. And she also shares her favorite saying, the two people she would most like to meet and the career she would do if she was not a lawyer, as well as other fun facts. Let's get into it. Hello, Louisa, and welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. My first question is always the same, Louisa. If we were meeting up in person, where would we be? Do you have a favorite wine bar, restaurant or cafe that you love to go to? And what would be your choice of beverage off the menu? So I would take you to Paris in the 6th arrondissement to a Lebanese restaurant called Au Bois Le Vent, where uh, you can eat the best food I have ever tasted. I can't really recommend one thing to order because... To truly enjoy Lebanese food, you have to come with friends and have several dishes on the table to share. But one thing I like to keep to myself, though, is their worst water ice cream. And they also have a fantastic wine menu. Oh, what would you choose from the dessert menu then, the ice cream? What's your favorite ice cream? Yes, uh, it's made of rose water, eau de rose. Oh, eau de rose. So rose water. Yep. Wow, I've never had that before. Rose water also goes into, I'm thinking, Turkish delight. Like yes, that, mainly. Yeah. yeah, mainly, mainly. Oh. And, and just delicious. And I, I think I would share it with anyone willing to oh. go with me. Wow, so we're going to Paris. That sounds great to me. Thank you very much for bringing in a, a very lovely place for which you go to when you go back to Paris. And you are from France originally, and it's just so fantastic to have you on the show. And I know when you were really young, I think only around two, you already had a nickname called yeah. The Lawyer. Yes, true. That's so fascinating. Tell me about those early days when we were when you were a child and into your early teenage years. So this is a fun fact I like to share. I actually started to talk at 11 months old and by the age of two, I was already fully fluent and apparently I was able to develop advanced questioning and advocating skills. So yeah, 
I was called the lawyer uh, within my family and I grew up with it. Wow. Yeah. And uh, so I kind of always knew I was going to study the law one day and try to live up to it. Wow. What happened then after that? Uh, paradoxically, as I grew up, uh, I developed shyness and um, I was reading and writing a lot rather than talking. And I indeed started to suffer from stuttering as a teenager on top of having a, you know, like this growing moody feeling you have when you are a teenager. Mine was oriented toward gender equality issues because I was reading a lot and I learned like what women had to fight for not so long ago. And it would somewhat make me anxious uh, when I thought of my future. And when I was 14, my parents encouraged me to participate in a charity project that involved storytelling courses because nothing we had tried so far regarding my stuttering issues had worked. And as part of the charity work, we had to write short stories and perform them on small stages. So basically friends and family to raise money to finance a cultural festival that was going to take place in Dakar, Senegal. So once I was there in Dakar, uh, we had to mix with Senegalese teens who had also been trained in storytelling. And then we had this project when we had like, we were giving around 10 days to work together and perform something new on stage. So a new tale to tell together. So we basically lived 24 seven between teenagers to make this happen. And, um, this was a truly life-changing experience for me in three ways. Wow. Let me stop you there for a moment because this is phenomenal. You're doing sort of thinking about law from an early time, but you're having this terrible affliction of stuttering while you're also trying to grow up as a teenager. And then this a brilliant idea comes up from your parents to participate in this charity project for storytelling. Of all things, storytelling <laughs> when you have a, a stuttering affliction. And I think this is amazing. So why was it life changing? Because this is really amazing. I think that the way that this impacted you from a very early age, because it's, it's come through everything else that you're now doing in Japan. But tell us about those three ways it changed your life. Actually, I think first I, I learned what privileges during my time in Dakar, I was living with people who became my friends. And I realized that they were living in what we would consider very challenging conditions, but still academically excelled, like still pass uh, the exams with flying colors in ways that I had rarely seen in France. And I think what blew me the most was to see the optimism with which they would view life, which was just beautiful. It was like they could see colors I didn't in life. So in front of people who were full of life and full of dreams, the moody teenager that I was, was simply put in checkmate, uh, if I may put it that way. Mm. I realized how fortunate I was and how little reason I had to be so anxious about my future. They really showed me how doing more with less was not only possible, but, but how it provided stimulating ways for me to challenge myself and to outgrow problems. Wow, that's amazing. Do you think your parents knew that you were going to have that kind of experience? Or do you think that's just something very fortunate that happened that you could put your life in perspective because of the other people that you were working with in this, this adventure you were having with the storytelling? So what I mean is, was this just lucky that you found this way <laughs> to see the colors that you didn't see yourself at the time i thought i was very lucky and it was something like new mm. uh, almost like a fairy tale um, but uh, when i came back and now with um years that has passed i think i understand that my parents perhaps saw what potential this trip right. this charity involvement could have for me amazing uh, because yeah because when i came back and told them about how i felt and all of that they had these smiles on their face and um, yes. anyway. <laughs> All right. So that's the first way it changed you. You learned what privilege is. So what else happened? What were the other two things? Yes. Yeah, so I understood how powerful allyship is because it plays such a pivotal role during this trip. 
Uh, as a matter of fact, I can't really recall the exact moment when I stopped stuttering in my everyday speech because I felt so good during my stay and I believe it went away without me even realizing it. However, I distinctly remember the moment when I dared to take the first step and test my speaking skills as a storyteller. It was when I had to take the stage and face the possibility of stuttering in front of 100 people, none of whom were friends or family. And at that moment, I think my attention was on the success of my performance and the contribution it could offer to the charity. I simply could not let my new friends down. And it was thanks to their support and belief in me that I had the confidence to surmount my challenges. So I really realized there that giving your best can be easier when you do it to lift someone else up. And in that regard, allyship and kindness played a profound role in my personal development even afterwards. And in a nutshell, I think kindness and allyship, they are underestimated but incredibly impactful drivers for change in society and organization. Yeah, this is incredible how you would actually go and do storytelling when stuttering is something that's afflicting you. And that's so brave, um, but you've put you. others ahead of you. you. You know, you're not wanting to let your friends down and you're putting the performance and the contribution to the charity ahead of yourself. And I think this is just amazing that you would do that. And at such a young age, but you're daring to take that first step and stand on the stage. So that might lead to your third, your third life changing experience. True. And this is the most important one, I believe, in the way I built myself. I discovered that stuttering was my superpower. During this journey of learning, storytelling and of self-discovery, I had to relearn how to speak. And it made me confront the significance of silence. I remember at a particular moment uh, that my instructor asked me to recall the situation in which I stuttered. And I noticed it happened when I didn't want to be somewhere or when I didn't need to speak. My brain was indeed protecting me from unnecessary speech. So even though I did learn how to use my words effectively, I also learned not to fear silence when necessary. And I have to say, I have never regretted embracing this lesson to this day. In essence, about this experience, I would say it changed my entire perspective. And after it, I made a promise to myself uh, never to allow fear to stifle my capacity for dreaming and making things happen. Rather, I would instead choose to become a problem solver. Yeah, that's just absolutely incredible. When you speak, you're giving me like a goosebumps, right? My body is feeling for you because you know, this whole point of protecting yourself from unnecessary speech, that's what you felt your, the confronting of the silence was. The silence was actually very good for you and mm -hmm. how significant it is. And in Japan, even now, when people are often silent, it's because they're thinking or they're doing something in their mind, trying to catch up with what was just said. So silence is such an important thing in Japanese culture. And I think as lawyers, we often just want to fill the gap, keep talking, try to not have silences. But this part you've just mentioned about silence being indeed protecting you from unnecessary speech. I think that's just brilliant. I'm really overwhelmed that you've shared this struggle with us. And is this the first time for you to tell people about this struggle on, say, a podcast? Yes. Wow. <laughs> Wow. And that you've come through this challenge and you're doing this, you're now speaking in, I know you're French, you're speaking in English so fluently. It just makes me so thrilled to have you Thank here you. that you can talk about this. You know, you're talking in a different language from your native language. If you could go back to that time when you were the just about to get on the stage, what would you tell yourself, that younger person? You're standing here talking to Louisa, who's that young. What would you say to her? Very good question. I have to think about it. <laughs> what I would say to the Louisa about to set foot on the stage, honestly, on this one, I will tell her keep going because I think I, my heart was in the right place. Because until now, what I have learned in my career 
is really that allyship and caring for other is, is a very powerful driver to to raise to occasions to do our best and uh, not to thinking twice before doing the right thing. And I think in that moment, I was not thinking about anything for that reason, because I was focused on, on, on that. I was on this dynamic. Yeah, it's brilliant because you're not thinking about going on stage. You're not thinking about what you're about to do or how excellent it has to be. You're thinking beyond that, the allyship, the making it work for your friends, the not letting them down. That's such a powerful driver, as you said, thinking beyond yourself to others. Yes, my, how can I say that? My, my being afraid of being ashamed or my stuttering in front of all those people I didn't know did not matter anymore. Ah. I could have handled it even if it happened because I was not even thinking about this. This was a, a secondary, like it was not the most important thing anymore. It was not the focus. No, and that is what is incredible about your story is that that was not the focus. Whereas somebody who, from me looking at you thinking, my goodness, is she okay? She, she's going to stutter. Is she going to be embarrassed? And that's not even crossing your mind because your heart is in the right place. True. And I think for the first one in my life, I think I was the only one in the room who didn't worry about this. Wow, that it's is amazing. Powerful. Absolutely amazing. And how significant. And I really hope someday you write a book about this. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, you know, and help others and teach them there's something else waiting for you to do with all of this because it's just incredible. Thank you. <laughs> I'm going to go back now and also talk a little bit about your career because I know you're with Micron now, but how did you get to this compliance approach to what you're doing? mainly with ESG. When did you first discover compliance? Actually, it was when I started my career at GE. I was a communication specialist uh, in the headquarters. I had just graduated uh, in foreign languages and I wanted to gain some practical experience uh, before uh, studying the law. At the time, I was working for the chief communications officer so I was in a C-suite, very multicultural and diverse environment. And it made it easy for me to offer my help here and there. And because I was so interested in the law, I would frequently visit the legal team's offices to see if I could support them in any way. So I started to, to have first missions, like helping write legally proof content for a communications purpose, and then took on various tasks. And as a result, with this and through exposure, I learned a lot about compliance and how to think accordingly, how to develop a methodology that makes sense. And it just became a significant pillar of my way of working, uh, even as of today. There is another dimension I would like to share about this experience, is that working at GE also planted a diversity and inclusion seed in my mind. So first, I discovered their company values through the code of conduct. And I was just amazed to see how mature they were in DNI uh, long before it became a popular acronym. Uh, and I then experienced it for myself. I saw how the culture was centered around meritocracy. And I indeed remember working on so many projects where I was trusted with great responsibilities that most people in other companies would not have given to me because of my junior status. But at GE, they lifted me up because they believed in my potential and they would just adapt to the means they allocated to me uh, just to ensure that nothing would hinder my performance. And there, inclusion existed without any need for me to self-advocate. So it was great. It was one of my best experiences. I was eventually offered a leadership program in communications but I had already planned to go back to school to start my law studies. However, this experience, though, made me want to learn more than just the law. And uh, I, already, I already knew I was a lawyer because of my nickname. So <laughs> uh, I pursued a master's degree where I could attend advanced ESG classes, join a leadership and diversity chair. And then I also completed a double degree in international and Anglo-American law. Amazing. 
So you're taking a side trip over to GE where you do the communications work and learn a lot about their DEI, their diversity, equity, inclusion, before it became a buzzword, as you said. And then you always knew you wanted to do law. So you suddenly go and do a master's degree, a double degree in international law. And yeah, yeah, you're also learning ESG then and under the leadership and the diversity chair of one person who was a kind of role model for you. True. Junko Takagi, thanks for mentioning her. <laughs> she was the, the head of the um, of the chair and um, again, meeting her and attending her classes, working on projects under her supervision were really like a true opportunity for me to grow and to really understand what leadership is about. Yeah, where because... is she? Is she still at the university where you went? Yes, actually. And uh, I'm always pleased to follow up on her videos uh, where she tried to teach some diversity and inclusion pills it's great so she's on <laughs> she releases videos that you can watch yes i'm Are going they, to have to oh. double check if he continues doing this but yes and um, is, is it in japanese no it's in english wow um, okay well let's let's link those in the show notes later so that others can listen to her i hadn't heard of her yeah and then she can listen to you today as well Let's hope so. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's so amazing. I mean, it's like you took a little sidestep, but there you are in the communications team and also helping out the legal department with a kind of like, you didn't have to be so invested in the legal department, but you could help them here and there and learn about communications uh, and tidy up the, the legal communications or outward communications from the office and then jump back into law. So that's incredible. And I'd, I'd never heard that GE was so far ahead. And so thank you for sharing that. After GE, you moved to Schneider Electric. Tell us about True. that. So I worked there for two years as a group sustainability performance manager, where basically I learned how to measure extra financial matters. I basically built relevant reporting frameworks that are compliant with soft law and regulations for various purposes. And then um, we use this data to enhance strategy. I remember the company being very advanced in environmental sustainability matters. And uh, I remember meeting wonderful people in this department. It was a very enriching experience where I not only learned a lot about um, how to quantify GHG emissions and uh, how to accordingly plan an environmental strategy, but where I also learn a lot of transferable skills from a very open-minded people. Mm. So I love how you call it extra financial matters because some people often call it non-financial, but I love <laughs> that it's extra too. It's an addition to, and it's just as important as financial. Thank you for saying that. So, wow, that was a great experience as well. And you're getting these transferable skills and then something happens and you come to Japan. Why yeah. did you come to Japan? Uh, actually, it was always a dream for me to live there. And uh, my undergraduate was uh, in foreign languages with a strong focus on Japanese. So basically, I spent three years learning kanjis, grammar, and <laughs> wow. translation. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> it had to pay out someday, I guess. Yes, you had to come here. So, so the Japanese was part of the foreign language degree that you'd done. Yep. Yeah, I see. So what happened? You arrived here and it's your dream to come and live here. Yes, actually, I started everything from scratch. And uh, I have found myself working more on diversity matters because I, I guess the recent ranking on gender equality speaks for itself. But this is where it feels like I would be the most helpful as an ESG practitioner. Right, because Japan has slipped again from 116, I think it was, to 125 on the World Economic Forum uh, listings. Yes. That's what you're talking about. Okay, mm -hmm. so instead of going into a law firm or instead of going in-house, you focused down on ESG. And what did you do then to start out as a diversity and ESG practitioner in Japan? Can you maybe set the scene a little bit about the legal framework in this area. And then I'd like to ask you about your thoughts for working in Japan in this area. Thanks. So over the past years, since the advance of abenomics, 
the Japanese legislator has taken several significant steps towards fostering a more inclusive environment. I'm thinking about the introduction of gender-related measures, such as the reporting of female workforce and representation in managerial positions, um, but also about the introduction of paternity leave. I think this provides a useful toolbox to advocate for concrete measures to the business leaders. And I also think these two steps will together be the cornerstone that will eventually help increase inclusion and enhance employers' capacity to retain underrepresented groups, not only women. However, as we speak, um, given the enforceability of these law provisions, their effectiveness still very much depends on how open the leadership really are to these changes. So while these laws have the merit of existing, I think it is essential to acknowledge that these are currently in the equivalent stage of soft law, and therefore DNI practitioners need to act as real business partners to get leaders on board in the business. And I would say beyond the legal aspect, I think the most effective sustainable work lies in transforming mindsets and attitudes educating people to understand not just the letter, but also the spirits of diversity laws and principle is to me crucial. Right, that's right. And so as you're saying, you, these cornerstones, the the new laws that allow reporting on the female work workforce representation in managerial positions and paternity leave. So for others who are listening and maybe struggling, how do they get their leaders to own this ESG you're talking about being business partners with them and helping support the CEO with ESG matters how do you do that how do you help that organization and support them so that everyone thinks about ESG and compliance not just compliance team's job or legal team's job have you got mm -hmm. any tips on how you could help people with that yeah true um, so I think it depends on which organization we are in uh, when you are in an organization when there is a strong governance on DNI, it's a bit easier because you have a strategy and an and, and agenda and KPIs, and so you can come with um, some matter to the business leaders. If it's not the case, then I think we need a bit to build our function. And working in Japan in this field has provided me with the most enriching and insightful experience in that regard. Indeed, my own background as a woman and a foreigner placed me in quite a good position to understand the challenges faced by diverse individuals in the workplace. And um, I would start by saying that I firmly believe that my job will be truly fulfilled at a company when employees no longer need to self-advocate for what they are entitled to. So I'm thinking equal opportunities, fair treatments and respect. And to answer your question, I think to pursue this, we need a strong focus on analytics, of course, but also uh, to pay attention to research findings. It is very important to spot overlooked issues, in my opinion, because we need to know what we manage, right? For instance, research has shown that men and women, while interacting and delivering similarly within their organizations, do not receive the same responses in terms of performance review and career projection. And in this instance, it shows that HR processes in some organizations will need to be enhanced, not to in hinder the development of talents and to prevent attrition of underrepresented groups. And this is a critical topic, business-like, if you ask me. I also think it is equally important to try to think outside the box to effectively take the pulse of a company culture for instance, as we celebrate the slightly increased representation of women in management positions, we can question how many men are in assistant positions. I think it is a strong indicator of how far companies are from the two-track mentality, you know, which is sogo shuku, which mm -hmm. is the career track for men, and ipan shuku, the non-career track for women. This yeah. typology of career has been commented by the CEDAW committee in 2003. Mm. But given the current metrics, I think there is obviously a need to follow up to figure out if and how the leadership mentality has evolved on this. 
Right. I think calling that one out is important, right? The women going into management positions, but how about men who are in assistant positions? That sort of says it all, really. <laughs> yeah, and, and showing that imbalance. True. I think that's because it comes down to a very fundamental part of how a company works. In an organization where women or men are not able to choose their career path, it is very unlikely that people will be responsive to any change-oriented program that will be launched anyway. Mm. Another important point for me is to embrace the approach of creating synergies between d and and ethics. Conversation must be, in my opinion, opened to address not only microaggressions and differential treatments, but also ethical questions surrounding them. So a very common and basic example is that if a company is not clear on the definition of what work or good performance is, then the definition of good business conduct will become equally unclear for middle management. For instance, if someone is not at their desk but delivers and meets their goals, is it deemed work? If so, and if it becomes the norm, it prevents the, the occurrence of many issues. It avoids the stigmatization or impression of special treatment for people who need flexibility, or even for people who simply work better with flexibility. So from there, I think there is no need to get into detail about the how, because you trust that you have hired employees that are responsible and can deliver. Mm, great example. And then again, there is no room for arbitrary micromanagement or behavior that says breaks parental leave harassment or gender discrimination laws. So in a nutshell, I think that endeavoring to understand the spirit and the letter of ESG soft law and regulations provides very effective risk management for an organization. Really great points. As a DEI specialist, do you have any tips for people who are listening who would love to do what you're doing? The kind of work you're doing sounds really cool. Uh, it's working, as you call it, in soft law, uh, which is becoming hard as we speak. But are there things that people should do to kind of be like you are? What steps would you recommend they take to concentrate on? So first, I would advise them to adopt the following methodology. So always base your work on data. Always try to have an open door policy and to speak with people to understand what's in people's mind. Uh, and then try to quantify it to really understand how your organization is doing. And then try to be as innovative as you can in the approach to try to tackle those issues. Because we are here to make, to make a shift, right? So we are not going to be able to provoke change if we do the same thing as before. So I think not being afraid of thinking outside the box. And then perhaps it should have been my second point, but try to educate yourself as much as you can about KPIs, because it's really important to be able to measure your progress. And then last but not least, you have to love it because uh, it's not an easy journey, <laughs> uh, especially when you, are, when you belong to underrepresented groups. You have to find a balance between self-advocacy and which battle you have to fight to advance the cause of people who face the same issue as you. So it's a really like um, energy and time consuming cause that I think need people to be passionate about to work. Mm, so yeah, loving it. Also being able to quantify the data that you hear people tell you about. I love that understanding what's on people's minds and quantifying it into data and then tracking it, making sure you've got KPIs to progress. What a brilliant answer. What, <laughs> other, what other tips do you have to inspire lawyers as they're maybe planning their career or thinking about their personal activities to develop, you know, 2023 and going into 2024? Do you have any tips? So I think the first one would be to Always choose your opportunities based on how you think you will grow and not who you will impress or how it will look on your resume. Uh, because ultimately what matters is what you can do and you can learn transferable skills. What I mean is at the end, you will always be able to build something that you are passionate at. 
if you choose something based on how you want to grow and how you think it will help you get there. Then this, my second advice would be to do what you love. And uh, then the third one, the most important for me, is not to be afraid of change because getting out of your comfort zone is everything. It's going to help you grow. Mm, interesting, right? So not be afraid of change, get out of your comfort zone, do what you love, but also that first one, choose your opportunities based on how you think you will grow, not what you think has to be done or what others are saying or pleasing other people. Brilliant. Thank you for that. And I'm going to ask you another question about thinking about the future, your crystal ball vision. I know you have a lot to do with ESG and you're a firm believer in ESG. Tell me more about that, what you think is coming up in the future. Yes, until recently, ESG was mainly soft law, uh, but, with, but, it, but it is changing with the new EU regulations that came into force during the past few years and very recently. So I think I would bet my next education investment that in five, six years, it will become a specialty found in all law faculties. At least I very much hope it will be the case. And as for Japan, I was pleased to see the recent publication of rules and guidelines regarding ESG-related disclosure obligations for public companies by the FSA. And uh, I was even more pleased to see that the inclusion of gender-related reporting was included within the scope for companies who are eligible. So I think these changes will hopefully offer more comparability and act as a more effective driver for robust ESG strategies. So I think I will be optimistic on this one and expect a positive evolution in the coming months and years. Okay. Is there any piece of advice then, the big piece of advice that you might give to, say, particularly to women lawyers or women working in Japan here for their success to working in Japan? You've been here how many years now? Uh, four years. Do you have any advice for women working in Japan in law? Yes. Um, I would say that we may encounter some people who will never give us their respect because we are women. Let's face it, <laughs> it happens. Uh, but I want to tell them it's going to be fine because uh, I think the key to overcome this is not to try to prove the person wrong by killing ourselves at work for them. I think the key is to outgrow the perspective that we need to prove ourselves. And I think to realize that we don't need said respect and that we would be better channeling this energy through making our projects and dreams come true. Mm, so don't need respect means we shouldn't really be looking for the respect. It, that's not the most important thing, to keep forging on, keep going and doing what we need to do to, to reach our goals. Is that what you're saying? True, because um, I think anyone is in the workplace uh, who have managed to enter a company has proven themselves. And this is the assumption that is made for men because research show that men are hired and evaluated on potential while women have to prove a track record of doing something to be trusted with it. And this is a perspective that is not enough challenged. And so when we are at work and we are in the situation when we are not giving the same level of respect we are entitled to as professional, I think we need to understand that we need to outgrow this on our terms and that the world is a very vast place and we will always find people with whom it will resonate, be it good colleagues, uh, mentors, sponsors, and that we will always make it. And if I could give myself an advice for many years ago, I think it will be this one. Just understand that everything will be fine as long as I do my best and try to emulate myself with the right people. Mm, yeah, that's really great information and advice for people. All right, then, well, let's come down to the last few questions as we wind up the podcast. Can you share a book or something that you are enjoying watching that you'd recommend to people? Yes, yeah, so for books, 
I would recommend any play uh, from Molière, who was a French playwright and poet. I really enjoy uh, reading them or go and watch them. Also, to give some references in Japan, I really like the Japanese author Yoko Ogawa. What does she write about? She writes a lot, well, <laughs> about women. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> And, and and their point of view oh. and how they go through life. Oh, good. Um, and, and I really like the way it is carried on. And I think it shows the beauty of the simplicity. So, sorry, I, I don't have my words to... No, that's <laughs> but, fine. Yeah. That's great. Thank you for that. We'll pop her name into the show notes as well as Moriere, the uh, French playwright. Thanks. So your favourite saying, what is it? So uh, it's a saying from Albert Camus. It's freedom is nothing but the chance to be better. I think it resonates a lot uh, in me. Freedom is nothing but the chance to be better. Yeah. Mm, what does that mean to you? Um, I think it represents well the journey I have been through and how I have built myself. Because uh, like to refer to my experience in Senegal, I really understood how energy and time is precious. And what wonderful thing you can do if you channel them in the right place. And to me, when I had discovered how facing diversity and diverse situation, seeing how that would lift me up, I could not develop another philosophy than think that if I have a choice, I will always try to get better, mm. become a better person for me and for, for my acquaintance and for society. Mm. Gosh, that's wonderful. Is there, a, <laughs> is there a famous person? You've already mentioned some really amazing people. Is there a famous person or celebrity that you would like to meet? Uh, actually, there are two. I hope it's okay to cheat this okay. one. <laughs> okay, no cheating. It's fine. You can give two. Thank okay, you. go ahead. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so the first one is uh, Voltaire, because I love how he developed a mastery of irony to cope with the times he was living in and uh, the noble causes he was very finely advocating for. Mm. And then there is uh, Giselle Alimi, uh, who was a French lawyer, author, and human rights activist, in which I, of course, include feminism. She became a lawyer to emancipate herself, but then she dedicated it. Uh, she dedicated her life fighting countless battles to defend women's rights against injustice. And um, she, she really has a great legacy because she achieved significant advancement in French law for women's health, safety and freedom. Wow. We'll pop those two people's names as well, male and female, right? Into yep. <laughs> the show notes. Good one. Okay. Well, I'm going to ask you if you could do something totally different tomorrow, a different occupation or business, what would that be? I think I would open an art gallery and uh, try to involve flowers. So I don't know how it will look like, but it's surely what I would try to do. Right. So you enjoy the garden and flowers? Yes, I am actually an avid gardener. Mm. Uh, green, green spaces are my happy places. Ah, green spaces, happy place. Exactly. <laughs> and one last question. If you were going to write a book tomorrow, what would you write it about? Oh, we already had a hint before, didn't we? There's one topic I think you could write about, but what would you say? <laughs> yeah, anything else that you'd write about? Uh, anything else than ESG and diversity? Um, uh, yes. Well, I think you could write it about ESG and diversity and also bring in your personal stories that you told us earlier today. I think that'd be amazing to put yeah. through the ESG and diversity lens. Yeah, actually, yes. Uh, and actually, as a matter of fact, I, I always have enjoyed writing. So this is something I have been doing for years. And uh, now I'm, I'm in the process of putting together books to like talk a bit about ESG and diversity, as a matter of fact. Well, great. We look forward to seeing those books if they get published outside of your uh, workplace and we can see them. That would be fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Louisa. We've come to the end of our chat today on the podcast. It was so much of a pleasure for me to speak with you and connect with you in this way. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wouldn't have done this first podcast with anyone else. So thank you so much. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. For <laughs> listeners who are listening and want to connect with you, how can they do that? Should they reach out to you on LinkedIn? Uh, yes, yes. Okay. This we'll is my main channel. 
Great. We'll put that channel, main channel, into the show notes. And if you've really listened to this episode and been inspired, and I surely hope you have, listeners, then please do subscribe and tell us about your biggest takeaway. Uh, Drop me a note or leave a review on Apple Podcasts or whichever podcast platform you're listening to. So go ahead and share this episode with someone you think would enjoy listening to it and be inspired to live a lawyer extraordinaire life. That's all for today. Cheers, come pie, and bye for now. Thank you so much for listening today to this episode of Lawyer On Air. I really hope that you were inspired by the story you heard and that you discovered something new about women in the law. Please subscribe to the show so that you don't miss future episodes. And if you can think of even just one person to share this episode with, that would make my day. I invite you to connect with me to talk more. Jump on over to LinkedIn or Instagram where you can find me or send me a message via my website contact page. That's all from me today. I look forward to seeing you right here on the next episode of Lawyer On Air. Cheers, come pie and bye for now.